My name is Patty Whitney. I work with Kentucky Avery. It's funny when my email is patricia.whitney. Patricia was always what I was called by my mom when I did something wrong. Yes. So I, I get over that. Yeah. Breathe. Okay. Um, but it's Patty Whitney. But you got to use Patricia in the email. Um, Kentucky Avery, they have a website. It's kyabri.org. There's lots of resources on that website. If you need to go and look around, um, Kentucky Academic and Behavioral Response to Intervention. Now let me ask you, how many have ever been to the Behavior Institute? Anybody ever gone to that? Fabulous, good. I'm on the, the board of CCBD and I help put that on. It's an every other year event. So this year we're not going to do a major event in Louisville, but in 2024 we will. Okay, so just, just so you know, and it's, it's this behavior conference. It's one of the largest behavior conferences in the United States. So that's pretty daggone cool. I mean, that's just really neat. So you filled out your survey. Next thing, what we need to know is we need to know about you. The reason why we need to know about you is because your experiences made you who you are. Everybody agree with that? All right. Um, we also know that morning routines make and break a day. Everybody agree with that? Okay. So I've got this little game. Now I'm not your typical presenter. This is going to be interactive as we go through here. We're going to have a little bit of break about 20 minutes in. We'll come back so that way if you guys need to refresh your coffee, get more um, food, whatever you need to do. And then we'll go, go back into the meat of the presentation. So for right now, the game is called That's Me. So everybody make a fist. Now, if I say something and that's you, you got to raise your fist high and in a very loud voice say, that's me. Okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. We're just going to try it. Now, this is, this is kind of geared so everybody's got to do it, so everybody play. Okay, here we go. If you are sitting at a table today, raise your fist. That's me. Okay. It's got to be louder and more enthusiastic. <laughs> All right, ready? If you're sitting at a table today, raise your fist. Hey. That's me. Perfect. Okay. If you are a coffee drinker, raise your fist. That's me. If you woke up before 6.15 this morning, that's me. <laughs> okay. What if you dressed comfortably? Raise your fist. Good, good. What if do you have a student with a behavior of concern? That's me. Good. And do you have a fur baby at home? That's me. Excellent. Good. So that's just a fun little opening activity that you can do. People like it because they have voice, they have choice. And you know, it, it's you can put in your questions whatever you want. You could make them academic questions, or you can make them personal questions. Okay, next thing. So we did this little activity, which is the personality inventory. Okay, everybody got it? Good. It's called, What's My Style, What's Yours? Now we're doing that because the way you approach people depends on how they need to be approached. Sometimes, have you ever just felt like you just got it wrong? And you approach somebody and then they, they like look at you like, where did you come from? <laughs> so what, what we've got to think about is everybody isn't the same. They truly aren't. If you have finished the personality inventory, raise your fist. That's me. Good. Okay. Next step. Tally them up at the bottom. 
So all you're doing is tallying each column, A column, B column, C column, D column. If you have a tie, that's okay. You can stand up for both. Okay? Here we go. If you tallied A as the highest, stand up. Everybody look around. Hmm. Okay, good. You, you guys can sit down. If you tallied B as the highest, stand up. Okay, good. If you tallied C as the highest, stand up. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. Okay, sit down. If you tallied D as the highest, stand up. <laughs> oh, you, you, <laughs> there's only two of you guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now this is really interesting. So as you go through these, we will tell you about how to approach the people and a little bit about their personalities. Now remember, your experiences throughout your years have made you who you are. A is the achiever, B is the persuader, C is the supporter, D is the analyst. So we have those two analysts in here. We're going to give them all our data. And, <laughs> yeah. and if you're from a school where you've got the analyst, they're, they're really handy to have around. OK. Now, so for the achievers, this is how you, uh, this is their personality type for the achiever. Now, you guys on the, Far ends, if you can't see well, I mean, feel free to move around or move your chairs, you know, you need to swing around a little bit. Okay, so the achiever, high risk taker. They're le less people oriented. They're confident. They like to be in control. Anybody know what the, those kind of people? They're forceful and direct. Okay. Persuaders, those are all also high risk takers. They're people oriented. They're spirited and social. These would be great people to have at a party. Um, they inspire and be inspired. They, they like to work with others. They, they're like that people, those people that you want on your team because they're gonna make it happen. Supporters, low risk taker. More people oriented, good party, good party goers, okay? Um, high ideas and standards. They're, they like calm. They don't like stuff all shaken up all the time. They don't like conflicts. And they like to be appreciated, like that verbal appreciation. Analyst, low risk takers less people oriented, high disciplined, very persistent. They like that reason behind things and they dig for more. All right, now um, what I need to tell you is I will upload the PowerPoint after the presentation because I didn't know how much time we'll have and so um, or how much I'd get through. Sometimes I tend to tell stories. And let me tell you this, um, I do have a chronic cough. I do not have COVID <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm not sick. I just have an esophagus issue. And so if I cough, it's, o it's all okay. <laughs> okay, just wanted you to know, been to a doctor for that. All right, now when working with achievers, when we work with that A personality, A personalities, please stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, everybody, everybody see those people? Sit, sit back down. Now when we work with them, we want to be very businesslike. They don't want a bunch of fluff. They want it just true, okay? We want to use facts. 
We want to be logical. And we want to make sure that um, if they have a question, that we're prepared to answer it. So if you're thinking about, and the reason why I'm telling you about this is not because of the people in this room. It's the people that you work with, your coworkers, your administrators, your parents of the children, and your children that you work with. They all have these different personalities. And so I just want you to understand that, that looking at the personalities and really trying to dive in to meet people where they are, sometimes you, you can tell, okay, this person, they're an idealist. They expect things a certain way and they're not going to be happy unless they see it that way. So the persuaders. These people, we acknowledge their strengths. We understand that, that they have those persistent ideas and enthusiasm, a lot of enthusiasm to make it move in their direction. These people also um, present their ideas and sometimes they like to be, you know, have that challenge, but you've got to be prepared. Um, and they like things in writing. They like those lists. If you're a list maker, that type of a personality is usually a persuader as well. Okay, so the, the B personality, you guys stand up. Let's see who we're talking about. Good. Okay, sit back down. Now, working with supporters. That was a whole bunch of you guys. Okay, so the supporters, calm, casual, friendly, Good conversationalists, they, keep, they can keep a conversation going. Um, they uh, like to be appreciated. So that person, you'd, you'd, maybe if they're your elbow partner, you turn around and say, I'm glad you're here today. Because they like that. Your kids, same way. Those kids at school, when they come in and they're the ones that, that help and they want to be teacher's helpers, and they want to help their peers, make sure you appreciate them because they like that. Um, being persistent with the ideas, these are the original idealists. These are the ones that they have it in their head that things are going to be a certain way. And when that boat gets rocked, sometimes it, it's not understood real well. Okay? And especially if you've got young people in this situation and their boat gets rocked, they don't understand why there was a change. You guys do because you've got some maturity. They don't. The analyst. We, had, we only had two analysts. Who was my two analysts? Stand up. <laughs> okay, okay. But that's okay. I'm, I'm glad you owned up to it. That's good. Okay, and then who were the supporters you guys stand up to? Good. Okay. All right. Now, so the analyst, this is step-by-step -step directions. They like it specific. They like it detailed. Um, they like to look and dig deeper. So that analyst, uh, there's very few of them, guys. That, is, that happens in every seminar. Very few analysts. Um, they um, want to know the ideas behind things. So if you're going to change something, they want to know your reasoning, your rationale. All right. Each personality is unique. Everybody is. You guys are as unique as it comes. So then we talk about what outcome, what experiences did you have in your life that shaped you? Now, I was a child of a counselor at a school. I was also a child of a maintenance man. So I've been given the gift of being able to fix things. <laughs> Therefore, I like the behavior in kids. I like 
the outward behavior because you can see it. And then you start thinking, what can we fix? Yeah. <laughs> and then you start thinking, you know, what is it? And so I like that. That has definitely shaped my personality. But you know, not all experiences were positive. And you have to know that. In the 1990s, there was a study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACEs study. And what this said is that with these 10 domains, that if you scored several of them, that it affects your health. Now, I know that you guys can't read these from you know, the distance, um, but I'll give you the PowerPoint. And if you wanted to Google ACES study, you can see the 10 questions. And these questions, what they found is that it definitely had a correlation of how you grew up. Now, I'm not saying negative experiences will make and break you. I'm not saying that at all because people are resilient. People can move forward and move past things. It all depends on how they look at it and how they deal with it and your internal personality, okay? So just think about, we've got situations that everyone has dealt with. Everything is not the same. With um, five of you at a table, I would, guarantee that all five of you have had a different experience, both positive or negative, within your life. So things are different. Things change. Your little people that come to you, those kids are completely different. Every single one of them. And when they said years ago, one size doesn't fit all, that is absolutely 100% correct. So, who was your inspiration? Who was your hero? You guys talk at your table. Now, you don't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> so, let's have you join this right, right over here. So, talk at your table. Tell me, tell the others, who was your hero? Who was your inspiration growing up? Mine was a coach. My parents were great parents, but my inspiration was a coach. All right, you guys talk. Got two minutes.
I raise my hand, you raise yours. If I raise my hand, you raise yours. Perfect. Does anybody have this hand signal at their school? Hand up. Yeah. Good. Excellent. All right. So we talked about your inspiration, your hero. In my lifetime, I've had lots of different experiences. I had very young parents. I had a dad that was a maintenance man, but he also had a TV repair job. And he did, did that kind of work in this little garage that we had. Well, at a very early age, like before school, I watched him go up and fix antennas. Well, he was an inspiration to me. When I was four years old, I was chinning up antenna poles and getting on top of the roof. <laughs> now, we lived on a major highway. And people would come by and they'd see a four-year-old the, on the roof and that just wasn't normal. And so, yes, my mom and dad got some calls. Um, but, remember, it's all about behavior. Later on, my parents um, signed me up for gymnastics because I couldn't keep my feet on the ground. I, I like the high things. Okay, so they signed me up for gymnastics. I ended up going to college, doing gymnastics. I ended up owning a gymnastics gym. We competed against people like Carrie Strug. I bought my equipment from Mary Lou Retton, new Bart Connors. Yeah, it was cool. It was really cool. But along the way, I had this coach. And the coach really must have inspired me. I mean, you don't think about who inspires you until after the fact. And then you look back and say, hmm, that's why I did what I did. Now, I've always been a teacher. When I went through college, you know, I got my teaching degree. But I chose to own a gymnastics gym. I chose to be a YMCA program director. And so, and then I decided, okay, rubber meets the road. Guess I better get serious and go into teaching. And so I did. Now, I used to run day camps at the YMCA. Hundreds of kids, two, three, four hundred kids a day. When I worked in public school, I had an EBD class of eight kids. And I was thinking, how hard could this be? <laughs> well, as you know, yeah, that days were challenging. But I learned early on from my coach, it's all about that coaching, coaching people to do the right thing. Don't keep telling them what they're doing wrong. Coach them to do the right thing. So as you coach, then you start thinking, is it happening? Are they listening? Later in life, and I always said, when you're old and gray, now look at me, uh, <laughs> I always said, maybe at that point, I'll get to know if I've made a difference. So, I did. I was in London, Kentucky one day, driving across, you know, the bottom of Kentucky. I'm actually, I live over in Russell County, by like Cumberland, and then, um, you know, my region, I go from Cincinnati down to Letcher County. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's quite the drive some days. But um, I was always wondering, did I make a difference? So I stopped in London, go to the bathroom at White Castle, come out, get ready to order my food. And this gentleman says, Miss Whitney, and I looked at him, and it didn't hit. And I'm going to change the name just, you know, just because. He said, I'm John. You taught me in middle school. I couldn't believe it. He said, it's because of you teaching me math that I am a foreman on an air conditioning 
company. And I thought, wow. If I wouldn't have made that effort, that kid wouldn't have made it. So you all think about the kids that you interact, the kids that you've had in the past, the kids that may come up to you one day when you're old and gray, and think about how cool that is. Guys, here's one more thing I always tell people. When kids go home, you are the only thing they have to talk about. That's it. Because school is their job. When, you go, when they go home, they will tell their parents the good things you did, and they will tell their parents how you were mean to somebody or how you said something mean to somebody. They will spill it all. So when, when they go home, make sure every single day you give those kids one positive thing to say about you. Just one. Because you are table talk. You're the only thing they've got to talk about. If you can start doing that, you will improve attendance, you will improve their work ethic, you will improve how they respect you and how they watch your back. Now when I was teaching school, they gave me Teacher of the Year one year. And I thought, why, why me? I had a small class. And they gave me Teacher of the Year because I did fun things with the kids, but they were always learning, always learning. Some of those kids, they weren't going to go to college. Some of those kids, I wanted to see them work and be productive citizens. And I made sure that they left me with a skill and with the ambition to carry it forward. Because I knew that next year's teacher may be a little harsher, may not have the same goals. So always leave them with something. Now, you make a difference in somebody's life. You do. Several years ago, remember I told you I worked at the YMCA? Several years ago, I got this letter in the mail. And this kid that I worked with at the Y is a grown adult, just got married, and he sent me this letter. It was three pages long. It was so cool. And he told me all the good things that had happened and why they happened. So what we're going to do, we're going to watch a movie, well, a movie, a video, and then we're going to take a 10 minute break, okay? And then we're going to get into what are we really going to do about what we've really got now and all this system situ situation that we have. <coughs> and I'm thinking it's going to work. and that he constantly needed that. 
and Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Miss Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's, and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Miss Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records, and she put Teddy's off until the last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is such a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has eternal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends, and he sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Miss Thompson realized the problem, and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper that he got from a grocery bag. Miss Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the students started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter when she explained how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stout stayed after school that day, just long enough to say, Miss Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. <clears throat> after the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. Miss Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind began to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class. And despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of the teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note on her door from Teddy telling her that she was the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school third in his class and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school. He'd stuck with it and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. Again, he assured Miss Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he'd ever had. Then four more years passed and yet another letter came. After he got his bachelor's degree, he had decided to go a little further. She was still the best and favorite teacher he'd ever had. But now, his name was a little longer. The letter was signed, Peter F. Stout, M.D. 
the story does not end here. There was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he'd met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago, and he was wondering if Miss Thompson might agree to sit at the wedding in the place that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Miss Thompson did. And guess what? She wore that bracelet. The one with several rhinestones missing. Moreover, she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stout whispered in Miss Thompson's ear, Thank you for believing me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Miss Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. You can never tell what type of impact you may have on another's life by your actions or lack of action. Please consider this fact in your venture through life and just try to make a difference in someone else's life today.